I'm Amy Lentz and I am the Associate Vice President for Alumni here at University of Idaho. And I'm really excited about our program for this hour. Um, as uh, Dean Cobb was just saying, we might have to do a part two because we probably will have great information um, in this discussion that'll go, our time will go really fast. Please know that uh, Sandy Larson, um, who's been a part of the Cup of Joes for a long time. She just celebrated 27 years, 20, 27, right, Sandy? With, with, uh, with University of Idaho. And um, she'll help us make sure that if there's muting that needs to happen, she'll, she'll make that happen. And she'll also keep us on, on track as well. So thanks, Sandy, for all your help. So with that, I don't wanna to belabor too much because we're gonna hear some great, great information here today. Um, our moderator um, might be a familiar face to many of you, um, but Johanna Kalb is our, was appointed to serve as the Dean of the University of Idaho um, College of Law in May of 2021. Boy, does time fly. Oh my goodness. Um, she is our first woman to serve in this role. And prior to her deanship, uh, Dean Kalb was the Associate Dean of Administration and Special in Initiatives um, and, and Edward J. Womack, Jr., Distinguished per Professor of Law at Loyola University in New Orleans. So quite a difference between New Orleans and Idaho, but um, both fantastic places to be, for sure. Um, her research and teaching interests include constitutional law, federal courts, and the law of detention and democracy. So quite, quite a background here. She also is a graduate of the Yale Law School and the John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, where she completed her MA in International Relations with a focus on African studies. So Lawrence, there you go. You've got a connection to your trip that you just took from in Africa. So you guys have a lot to talk about, I'm sure. So welcome everybody, welcome vandals, welcome non-vandals, welcome students. We're really, really glad to, to have you. And with that, I am going to turn the time now over to Dean Kalb. So thank you, Dean Kalb. And we are excited to, to have um, more questions to, the, to our guests. So thanks. Fantastic. Well, I've had to cut down our guests' uh, extremely long biography so that there we have some time for us to actually ask him questions. So um, just know that... Uh, um, just, he's done even more than I'm going to be able to cover here. So he, so Lawrence Wasden was Idaho's 32nd Attorney General. He was elected to his fifth term in in 2018, and he was the longest serving, is the longest serving Attorney General in the state's history. His career as a lawyer has been dedicated almost entirely to public service, for which we're very grateful. He served he served in the office of the Attorney General for more than 29 years. Uh, starting in 1989 with his appointment as a deputy assigned to the Idaho State Tax Commission. And he was later promoted to deputy chief of staff and then chief of staff before winning his first election to, off to the office in 2002. Throughout his career, he's been recognized for his leadership in the legal profession, public health, protecting children and consumers, prosecuting public corruption, and promoting open and transparent government. In 2014, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award for the Leaders in Law program that's, that's sponsored by the Idaho Business Review. He was chosen by his Western colleagues in 2010 to receive the Courage and Public Service Award, a rarely given honor that recognizes the courage and integrity that he has always brought to serving Idaho and its citizens. And last and certainly not least, the University of Idaho College of Law also awarded Mr. Wasden the Faculty Award of Legal Merit in May 2015. He earned his JD from our law school and was admitted to the Idaho State Bar in 1985. And before that, he uh, did his Bachelor of Arts in Political Science at BYU and graduating in 1982. He and his wife, Tracy, were married in 1980, and they have four children and 11 grandchildren. So that's the official bio. On a personal note, um, Lawrence Wasden was one of the first people to welcome me to the state of Idaho and to offer his assistance in any way as I began as a new dean. And, and then he didn't forget me. Um, anytime our paths crossed, uh, he once again reiterated his support and cheered me on. And, and for those of you who joined the call early, he did it again today. So 
Um, it, it, it is, uh, he's just been an incredible supporter of mine. Um, and we all have days when we need that. Um, our law school is staffed by a number of talented people who all trace their professional roots to his office. Uh, one of them who's on this call told me last year that he was the best boss she ever had and then apologized. <laughs> so I'm striving very hard uh, to uh, live up to the wonderful example that he offers. Um, but in all seriousness, he's had a defining influence on the development of our profession through all of these people who came through his office and through who he mentored. Um, and that is going to extend truly for generations. Uh, his commitment to rule of law is unwavering and unparalleled, and I am truly honored to have this opportunity to catch up with him and with all of you. And uh, both of us are chatty. Uh, we're going to try pretty hard to, uh, you know, keep it under control. Uh, Sandy, if you need to mute one of us, uh, by all means, I'm speaking for you, Lawrence. Um, you can do that as well. Uh, but we're going to try to talk until about 20 minutes to six and then open it up uh, because I'm sure there's others who would like to ask you questions. So to start us off, I just I'd love to know a little bit more about your background before this incredibly impressive biography. You know, how did you grow up and what inspired you to come to law school? How'd you find your way to us? Well, that's it was great questions. I'll get to them in a second. First of all, Dean, I wanted to repeat what I said earlier. I am so proud of you and what you've accomplished for the law school. Your story about how you came to the University of Idaho is an incredible story. And within, I, I think, days of your arriving here, you found out you were moving the entire law school to an entirely new location. Amazing and incredible, and we are very lucky to have you. I also wanted to make mention of someone else who I, I earlier mentioned is my hero, and that, and that is Judge Dean President Don Burnett, who has had as profound an effect on the legal profession in this state as anybody that there is. And uh, my hat's off to you, and you are, again, my hero. And I, I appreciate that very much. Now, the question you ask is, what brought me to the law? What brought me to the University of Idaho? And uh, when I was about five years old, I was watching television with my mother, and I watched uh, Perry Mason. And <laughs> during the program, I said to my mother, I want to be a lawyer. Now, I've since decided that it's not very wise to allow a five-year-old to determine their life's work, but that's the way it was, and that was my goal, and that was um, my stated goal and the focus of my work in uh, grade school and high school and um, I mean in, in high school just kind of a strange kid I was not the I was not in the athletic group because I just don't quite have that build and uh, you know I, I didn't really fit in a lot of other groups but one thing I did is I went into every class this sounds strange but I shook the hand of every student in every class every day which was good practice for what I had to do later on in life. Um, but then I went to BYU and uh, enjoyed my time there immensely. Uh, the year I applied to law school was at th that point in time, the largest number of law school applicants in the history of the country. Uh, everybody was trying to dodge going into the workforce because things just weren't really great. Uh, I was very fortunate to be admitted to the University of Idaho, which was really my first choice. I'm an Idaho boy. I was born in, in Caldwell, grew up in, in uh, Nampa, Twin Falls, and, and Lewiston. I mean, I'm just, I'm just a product of Idaho. So for me, that was, that was my first choice. It was great. I loved my time. I thank the university for giving me an opportunity to serve in my community that I could not have done otherwise. Without that education, without being admitted to the bar, my impact on my, the world around me would have been far less um, impactful and, and much different. So I am so grateful for that education. Now, I didn't have a good time in law school. Uh, I got married just before we went to law school. My oldest son was born about two months before I started law school. I had two children by the time I was done. Um, I was studying at home and taking care of children. One of the great lessons I learned about Moscow, and I had to ride around on a 10-speed bicycle with a bite with a baby in a baby seat, a diaper bag, 
a briefcase and a backpack. Now, one of the great lessons in life that I learned is that if you happen to slip on the ice and stick your baby's head into a snowbank, don't go home and tell your wife because she will never forgive you. So, and that's a true story actually happened. Um, great kids that, that we were in, I was in school with, the graduating class in 1985, I, I think Dean, you mentioned a moment ago, the tremendous impact that they have had on the legal profession in this state. Uh, Supreme Court justices, Idaho uh, Court of Appeals judges, many district judges, uh, longtime practitioners in private practice, uh, the names you recognize. Uh, so I mean, we've had a, a huge impact on the legal profession in this state. And I love Moscow. I love going back to Moscow. Um, I, I will tell you on one occasion, I, as I was campaigning, my first campaign, I went to a very small community in Northern Idaho. Northern Idaho has a different social structure than Southern Idaho. And so their local congregational meeting places are established around certain um, alcohol consuming uh, venues. And uh, <laughs> I walked into one of those venues and I, a guy just, he says to me, I happen to be LDS, he says, what's a Mormon from Southern Idaho doing up here in one of our watering holes? That was a darn good question. Um, and I, I didn't realize that I reflected that sort of flavor, but I guess I do. Um, I went to another uh, location uh, in a nearby town and walked in and had a conversation with a couple of patrons of the establishment. It was obvious that they had been there for a considerable length of time uh, by the slurred speech that they were engaging in. One of them um, wanted to know what I was going to do about the uh, high cost of prescription drugs. And when I told him that there were really market forces in play, he did not like my answer. And so he decided he would discuss with me the uh, intensity of his dislike for my answer. And so as he stood up from his bar stool, he stepped toward me and his, his companion stood up and fell against him and knocked him and trapped him on the bar, allowing me to escape out the, out the front door. So, you know, perhaps I don't have quite the same set of social skills that others might have around the state. But um, my question, the question was, I grew up, I'm just an Idaho boy, went to BYU, went to the University of Idaho, loved my time there, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity it's provided me to serve in my community. There you go. Sorry, I was having a little trouble unmuting myself. Um, so I'm finding all these things that we we have in common. I too am uh, not an athlete, uh, as you maybe also because of my my uh, build. Um, and I also had an early experience in Moscow with someone else who's on this call, Tara Malik, where I ended up in a watering hole I shouldn't have been in, uh, and met my first uh, set of students at a bar called Mingles. Uh, during trial advocacy uh, due to her very uh, unfortunate influence. So lots of para lots of parallels. Uh, and, and Tara is amazing. She's an, an incredible lawyer and a wonderful person. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so your class, you were talking about, your class was truly epic. I mean, what what do you credit that to? I mean, I know you said you didn't have, you know, you, you had two kids, you were married, you weren't going to the watering holes, you know, so you weren't having fun, but but you were telling us earlier that that you continue to connect with these people and you have this really strong bond. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more about, you know, what was your law school experience like that that brought you all together and what was going on in the water that produced all these jurists, you know, <laughs> judges, attorney, you know, I mean, all these yeah. incredible people. We were able to develop a very close bond, bond of friendship. And, you know, there's always friendly competition, those kinds of things. But we also developed a very great sense of closeness of who we were and what we were going to do to represent Idaho. Um, we've done that. We've uh, Most of us are reaching the ends of our career, not, not the finish necessarily, but we're nearing the finish line. And, and uh, it has been a great thing. We still call each other often. Uh, we get together every 18 months or so and and just sit around and talk. And that's a very refreshing thing. And I know there are a lot of people who talk about the good old boys uh, club, you know, but 
And there is a, in that sense, a good old boys club, but it's not really an undermining uh, effort in Idaho law. It is a fact that because I am familiar with the people that were two years before me and two years behind me, that's a five year span of folks. I can go to any community in the state and there's somebody there that I know mm -hmm. from school and they don't always agree with me. I don't always agree with them, but we can sit down and we can talk and it creates a bond. It creates a forum for discussion, which in which you can have serious and difficult conversations and you still walk out and your friends. And that's a, that's a very healthy environment for us as we practice law in this state. And I think that that continues today. I mean, obviously we are a bigger law school and we now have the two campuses, but um, within their separate campus communities, which are of course not totally separate, but are also, you know, um, share a lot of overlap and, and communication. Um, we're still a small law school and, and, and students still graduate knowing each other. So I'm so glad to hear you say that because I think that's something that, that makes the practice of law in the state so special. Um, I was noting to you earlier that I was recognizing so many people as they signed on and then realizing that, that that's only been that's only two years, less than two years. Um, you probably know all of them and their partners and their children. And uh, it's it's uh, I've never lived any place like this before. It's really unique and, and really special. So it sounds like my next question is about how you ended up running for office, but it sounds like that started when you were in elementary school. So uh, how did you decide to really start running for office? Um, well, I probably got to give a little background as to what my professional career has been. Um, one of the things that happened to me is that when I was graduating from law school, I had gotten a job in a private firm. And just before I took the bar, the managing partner of the firm said, well, you know, I know I told you we had a job, but we don't because now this space is occupied by somebody else who was a judge who had participated in some nefarious activities and was no longer on the bench. So I'm the, I'm the odd guy out. And so I, I had to just beg off on trying to find work because now all the work was gone. Everybody got jobs. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I, I knew I had to concentrate on the bar exam. So I did that, passed the bar and went out knocking on doors and got a job as a deputy prosecutor in Canyon County, uh, which was a good experience for me. We, uh, at that time, we were doing about the same number of uh, criminal prosecutions that Ada County was, but we had half the staff. So you were running like a mad fiend the whole time. And uh, that doesn't say a good thing for a crime in Canyon County, but it was a very, very good experience. And then uh, <clears throat> went into private practice for a little while, um, and happened to also be appointed to, to be the prosecuting attorney in Hawaii County and uh, got into a very ugly murder case. It was the murder of a police informant and pretty, pretty strange things happened there, but I separated from the law firm because of that. It's a story I'll tell you some other time. <laughs> and uh, then uh, went, was, was concentrating on my prosecution in Hawaii County. I wasn't willing to move to Idaho County uh, excuse me, Owyhee County, not Idaho County, Owyhee County, um, and uh, was then hired by Jim Jones, worked for Larry Echohawk, and then for Al Lance, he asked me to be the chief of staff, which I was for almost eight years, six years, I think, and then uh, I, it had always been my plan to, to run for a political office. That opportunity arose, and I ran and was elected, so uh, that's kind of the, the, the history and story of it. My transition from the chief to the attorney general, some offices go through a great deal of trouble in transition. My transition was I picked up a stack of papers, I walked through a doorway, <laughs> and I sat down at a different desk. Now, actually, in that process, I made a pretty serious mistake, and that is that I picked up the stack of papers because the role of that lead is different from the person who's running the controls of the machinery. And I'm, I'm sure you, you're familiar with what I'm saying, that yeah. as that head, that you, you have a different set of responsibilities and, uh, and, and people have to perceive you in a different way. Mm -hmm. So I, it took me a little while to learn that lesson, but I did and figured out what, I, what my real role was and how I was supposed to do that. I will tell you that in the process of campaigning, I'd worked on a lot of campaigns, I volunteered, I thought I really knew how it all worked. But when you're the person 
in the chair, when you're the person that's on the podium that's speaking, um, political campaigning becomes a very, very different thing. One of the challenges I faced was that having been the uh, chief, uh, there, and there's very few of those in the country, by the way, there's only about five or six of us who served as the chief and then uh, were elected as AG. But in that original campaign, there was a very highly placed political figure and she was unhappy with me because I was saying, here's how we're gonna do this. We're gonna do this as a lawyer would do it. Mm -hmm. And she said, you cannot do that. You have to have something more than that. And I'm, and I'm saying that's not really what it's about. I was trying to concentrate on upholding the rule of law and fulfilling the rule of law. And a lot of the political folks around really didn't grasp that. In fact, some, many of them still don't grasp that. So anyway, that was my answer. There's a lot of wisdom in there. And I do think having been an associate dean and then becoming the dean, I'm still, in fact, I just had a conversation with my leadership team about it today. You know, it's, I was the person who solved all the problems and now I'm the person who has to help other people learn how to solve exactly. their problems. And exactly. you know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to make that transition. And I also know it's real different to be the person sitting in the chair than it is to be the person behind the scenes yep. making it all go. So I have, uh, I have, I can I can relate. Um, so um, so I'd love for you to sort of reflect back over your distinguished career, and I'd love for you to talk about you know some of the real highlights. Um, and I'd also love you know I think we all we spend a lot of time talking about the wins, and I think it's always really really important that um, that all of us, but particularly you know students and people starting out in their careers also hear that people who have been, you know, just as incredibly successful as you have been over such an extended period of time, have hit real bumps in the road, have had, you know, really real challenges. And, and so I'd love for you to, to talk a little bit about the highs and the lows and, and how you manage through both of them. Well, um, my first jury trial, I tried a DUI case against a pro, pro se defendant and I lost. Mm. Uh, that, <laughs> sorry, that, I should have muted for that part. <laughs> that part. It's, it's funny, it's funny. Oh my gosh. But I, you know, I was all gung ho. I was, I was ready, I was a hard charger and um, I didn't read the jury. I didn't read the feel of the courtroom. So there is something to that. There was a very valuable lesson that I learned. You talked about some of the lows. So, well, there's one of them. But it was an incredibly important experience in my career yeah. to, to pay attention to what's going on around you. Don't be so focused on what you're doing. You, hey, yeah, you have to stay focused. There's, I'm not saying that. But you also have to have some peripheral, peripheral legal vision. Mm -hmm. and see what's happening around you and you have to respond to that recognize it move with it or else you're going to get run over and so I, that was for me that was a very important experience uh in my career um i had as i mentioned that that, that murder case that was very very difficult it was it was gruesome it was awful it was um you know a a, a murder of a young woman that uh bordered on torture of her and really gruesome things that happened. And there's another story about that. It's not the story of the case itself, but the periphery. And that is that, that uh, there was a lot of people that wanted to get their finger in the pie on that kind of a case because of the potential notoriety. And that is for, you know, a, a private practitioner that wants to say they've done this really great thing. And one person said, well, the mayor's wife said that I should be the one prosecuting this case. Well, I don't know that the mayor's wife has the authority to designate who will prosecute a criminal case, but those are the kinds of things that happened. And so in, in, in one sense, I'm saying keep a, a, a mm -hmm. vision on the periphery, but at the same time, you have to have sufficient focus that you can perf properly perform your function in litigating that case. Because had I allowed the periphery to control me, that case would never have happened the way it was supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have to have those two things. That was a really, really big challenge for me. Yeah. Probably the hardest thing I've had to do 
as the attorney general, and this is controversial, but it is very difficult. And that is twice I have had to be the chief legal officer at the execution of a death sentence. And um, make no mistake about it, what you are doing is you are participating in the taking of a human life. And it is, it is emotionally and professionally very challenging and very draining. And I don't say that with pride. I say that simply because that's probably the most difficult thing I've ever had to do. And you were up all hours of the night. Your whole team was, my whole team was there with me up all hours of the night. Some of those people are now serving on the court and some of them are serving with you and very, very difficult challenge. And that is, I'm not the person who makes a decision about what the outcome will be, but I have to, I actually had to call one of them and say, we are, we have to hold because we have some extraneous filings and we cannot take the risk that there's, that a court will hold differently. And I had some folks really upset with me about that. And the answer is, those are the kind of decisions you have to make. Uh, in my career, I've had some, some challenges. When I first came into office, some of you may remember that uh, I ended up filing criminal charges against the city mayor of the city of Boise and his uh, human resource director and his chief of staff. And uh, at that time, I uh, had a, a person who came to my office and sat across the desk from me and he shook his finger in my face and said, uh, you're going to be made a fool. Uh, this is an innocent man. What that person didn't know is that in my desk drawer sitting right in front of me, I had the email traffic of this, these persons describing the way they were committing their crimes. I mean, it was their own email. They were in my desk at the time he's shaking his finger at me saying, you know, you're going to be made a fool that they're innocent people. Well, we ended up trying those cases. And one of the allegations was that we were abusing their religious rights, which we weren't, uh, and ultimately sent all three of them to, to jail. And at the conclusion of that, that person came to me and said, well, well, I didn't know that. Well, duh, you know, perhaps you, you ought to give a little bit of credit that somebody that has taken the time to know what the facts are. And so I've been always very careful about being critical of other, the approaches that other people have taken because I don't know what the facts may be. Uh, I'm privy to what I do know, but I'm not privy to everything. And so I've had some, some challenges in that regard. One of, a number of the other big challenges that I've had, um, you know, most recently was uh, the Texas versus Pennsylvania case. And this, it, it, it's actually a, a, a microcosm of many of the things that I've had to deal with. And, and that is that in that case, Texas filed an um, original action in the Supreme Court, ostensibly to challenge the uh, outcome of the 2020 election. That really wasn't the legal question being asked in the case. The legal question being asked in the case was, can one sovereign state sue another sovereign state for the defendant state's exercise of its sovereign power? And the answer to that question pretty readily is no. The, the, the legal analysis, quite frankly, was very straightforward, very easy. The politics of that were terrible. Uh, and so, you know, I, I take a look at that and say, no, the, the law is pretty straightforward. We're going to do what the law says. In response to that, I got, and, and quite frankly, I knew at the time that that would be a, a do or die in, in the next campaign. It was not that I'm stupid, not that I don't know what's going on, but the question you have to ask yourself is, Am I willing to pay the price to do the right thing versus the politically popular thing? Um, and in response to that, I received 30,000, that's 3300000 phone calls in three days, crashed our entire phone system at the AG's office. I have a phone here at home that they crashed that phone as well. I don't even answer that phone anymore because People call and leave their nasty messages and their threats on that phone, and I just delete them after I hear them later. I don't answer that phone. Uh, but so the question really was, did I have the stamina, the willingness, the, the uh, legal correctness, the respect for the rule of law to stand 
in the face of tremendous political pressure. I'll leave that to others to judge whether I did or didn't. But from my perspective, I did what was right. And uh, I, will, I, will, I live and will live and am willing to live with the consequences of that because it's more important to do what is right than it is to do what's politically popular. And that isn't something everyone feels. I had a conversation with, um, it was actually a presentation at the University of Idaho Law School on DACA. And uh, there were some people really upset with me about DACA and very, very angry. And I went, went in and the very first thing I said is, well, let's read you know, the constitution, article one, section eight, where Congress is the entity that has the power to make uh, uniform laws on naturalization. Uh, and, and, and folks hadn't bothered to sit down and read that. And, and we need to, we need to remember that that's the basis of what we do. And uh, so I, in, in the context of that discussion, they were raising all kinds of great policy arguments. My response is great policy, bad process. That if you allow one president, not even by an executive order, but by a simple memorandum to alter federal law that is committed into the hands of Congress, we no longer have a, a constitutional government. What we have is a king. And then to have the next, and, and if he can do that, if a, he or she, a president, can simply alter federal law by a memorandum or an executive order, then the next president can come in and repeal that. I mean, we, we've completely abandoned uh, our commitment to a constitutional system. I think that's very dangerous. And I'm aware of the cases and all of that. And, but as a principle, that is a very frightening thing to me that we can simply abandon the principles of the constitution because Congress is either not taking an action or taking an action with which we disagree. In that, in that whole context, one of the lawyers that was very angry with me and she followed me outside after I finished my presentation. And she said, this is a quote. She said, well, we're lawyers. We believe in the rule of law and all that stuff, but this just doesn't make you feel good. And my response to that is we don't live by the rule of feel good. We, we live by the rule of law. And I don't see the rule of law as the rule of law and all that stuff. I, I see that as an essential element of what we do as lawyers and why we do it. Um, you know, I, I've had many experiences where I was the, the sole guy doing doing the job. The, the, the lawsuit with regard to the uh, with regard to the cottage sites, cottage sites as they're called, uh, recognizing those are parcels of land that were granted to the state of Idaho at at uh, uh, our creation as a state in 1890, and that were held in trust for the benefit of education and other beneficiaries. And we have an obligation to obtain under the constitution a maximum long-term financial return. Well, we weren't doing that by any stretch of the imagination. What we were getting as a return on those properties was about 1.7%. And the market rate was, was to be between four and 6%. Now I'm not a great mathematician, you know, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> it, when I went to school, 1.7 was less than four. And I, I think that's still true. Um, and so there was no way in which we could be fulfilling our fiduciary duty to the, uh, to the uh, school children of the state by carrying on that activity. Well, so I, I, I informed the other members of the board, if you take this action, I will sue you. Well, you know, they took the action and I fulfilled what I said I was going to do. And uh, there was a lot of people that were really angry. A very highly placed political figure took me aside and said, uh, one Republican shouldn't be suing another Republican. And I'm going, the political party is completely irrelevant. It, it is a constitutional duty. It is a responsibility that I and I alone have. And ultimately that's what uh, the U Idaho Supreme Court said is, yeah, this is a unique duty to the attorney general. In that whole category, uh, Another highly placed political figure said to me, well, why are you being mean to my friends in McCall? And I said, I'm not being mean to your friends in McCall. I'm upholding the con. I actually, she cut me off as I was trying to say the word constitution. And she said, you can't stand on that. <laughs> if we can't stand on the constitution, then honestly, what is it we stand on? What do we stand on? And so 
I guess I'm trying to demonstrate the rule of law is critical in my view in what we do in our profession. Can we have the debates and differences about facts and, and the law? Yes, hallelujah, that we have a, a, a place where we get to do that. But ultimately, it is that rule of law that controls our society. Otherwise, we're in bed. And that makes no sense. We, we have anarchy if we don't have the rule. Well, you know, I asked you this question that was actually about your successes and your challenges, and and you went went in hard on the challenges. But I think, as you've shown, that those are those were also your successes. You know, those are the moments when um, you, you know, it, it it really mattered that you were in the roles that you were in um, because the outcome might have been different otherwise. And I think. Um, I certainly thank you for it, and I know lots of other people do. So we have two minutes before we're going to try to open it to questions. Well, I've, been, I've been carrying on, haven't I? I'm sorry. Like I said, there's going to be a part two, but I just want to give them a chance to have questions. Otherwise, we can keep going. I mean, I've got <laughs> lots, lots to talk about. Um, and this one is a, a, you know, a little bit is a little bit of a cheat because I, I know at least part of the answer, but I'd love to know. What's on the horizon for you, and uh, what are you working on? What are you thinking about, and uh, and how does it involve the University of Idaho College of Law? Well, uh, I get asked that question a lot, and um, you know, I had a really tough year last year. It was very, very difficult. I had some severe health challenges. Um, just about, just about didn't make it. It was, it was very, very difficult. So right now, I'm taking a little time to just to just chill uh, and uh, it's nice to not have to go to land board meetings <laughs> or go to the legislature. <laughs> and in the future, um, you know, I've, I've got a, my finger in a few, a few pies and um, I'm not gonna give up. I, I think I still have something I can contribute to the community and I wanna do that. I'm, um, you and I have had a conversation. I, I'm looking forward to the next fall. I, I, I'm probably going to have an opportunity to interact with a few University of Idaho law school students. I'm really looking forward to that. I think that I, I do have something I can offer those students, and I think that I can also learn from those students. I think those are both healthy things, and I'm still in, involved in a number of things internationally with the project I started in Mexico. That's the basis of my having gone to Africa, uh, that I was asked to speak to the Africa, African Prosecutors Association annual convention in Mombasa. And so I am, and I, I got there and they changed my subject three times. And mm -hmm. so I still made a presentation uh, talking about the uh, repatriation of the proceeds of crime, which I've had some experience doing in El Salvador and in Mexico and other places. And so uh, I'm just I'm keeping my finger in the pie and seeing what happens. I am actually looking for those of you out there. I'm looking for some things to do, but give me, give me a little, give me a little time. Just a little bit of time, but we're really excited to have you teaching with us this fall. And, um, to it. you know, I think our students are really lucky and, you know, who knows what might blossom uh, from that. So, uh, so I promised uh, we've actually done a very good job, Lawrence, for two people who like to talk a lot. It is 540, just turned 541. And so, you know, I, again, I have a very long list of questions, um, but I'd like to at least give uh, others in the room an opportunity to ask some. So uh, Amy, are you, uh, do you have a list? Oh my gosh, yes. There's, All right. Wow. And, and I'm going to start with some of the questions that came from the students um, and the early prof uh, professionals in the law area, but some of these questions came in from a lot of other people. So I'm going to, I'm paraphrasing on some of these questions, but the gist of it is, is that there that people are seeing a continued rise of extremism and radicalization, both nationally and in Idaho. And this person in particular is a young attorney. It can be pretty discouraging and sometimes demoralizing, particularly working for the state in which there's such a, there, there seems to be a strong anti-government sentiment. So what advice do you give to students to other attorneys that believe in this rule of law from avoid getting discouraged and, and what action can they take? What actions can they, they take or consider? I would say this, I would say 
I, I've experienced the discouragement. I understand the challenges. And if you think about it, the, the left hand and the right hand, actually it's a circle. They actually need each other on the opposite side of the circle. You watch what they're doing. Their tactics are the same, even though their politics are different. And that is a very big problem. But at the same time, you have all the rest of the circle where you have people who are committed to the rule of law, even if they don't always understand it. But we, as the legal profession, we are the bulwark. We are the defense against the failure of the rule of law. And, and I, I mean, we should have our debates. We should argue hard in court, but we are the bulwark, the defense of what is the constitution. That's how it was intended. Recognize what your role is, fulfill that role, and it will be a fulfilling career for you. And yes, you can overcome the moments of uh, depression and darkness that come when other folks don't. And is there a, a rise in radicalism? Yeah, both on the right and on the left. But there are minds out there. There are people that we can touch and we can help, and they will rise to the center which is where we, where we need to go. The pendulum will swing back at some point in the future too. Great, yep, here's, here's another one that ties in. How does the political environment impact the work of the attorney general and, and how did that change? <laughs> You're laughing. <laughs> oh, I am laughing, I am laughing. Um, <laughs> politics. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna say it how I, how I believe it and people can disagree if they want to. I believe the one of the most critical positions in state government, and I will say also in the federal government, is the role of the attorney general to be willing to sacrifice what's politically popular for what's legally correct. And I've seen good federal AGs and I've seen really not good ones. Um, I was in a, a meeting once where a federal attorney general told me and of the rest of the AGs in the country, Oh, it's all right. You can just ignore your state constitutions uh, if you don't like what the policy is. And I say to that hogwash, uh, I think that's a violation of my oath of office. And so I think it's really important for us to, to maintain that, in, uh, that emphasis on what the rule of law is. And we, we can be successful. That doesn't mean you're going to win every case, but it does mean that we can uh, step sidestep that politics. Now, there are those, and I'll tell you, if you look across the ranks in the United States, you will see that there are two kinds of attorneys general. There are a number of attorneys general, both on the left and on the right, who are using that as a stepping stone to someplace else. And their interest isn't upholding the rule of law, fulfilling their duty as an attorney general. Their, their goal is, how can I get my name in the newspaper? Uh, how can I be viewed as this wonderful hard left or hard right or something else? Um, should that politics play that role in the office of the attorney general? My view is no. I spent 20 years walking that line um, time and time and time again. I, you know, I mean, you probably remember the case with the two uh, law enforcement officers that shot and killed the rancher when his bull was out on the highway and all of the things that were associated with that. Why did I call it that way? I called it based on the facts and the law as it applies in that case, not based upon uh, the signs they put up and um, said no justice uh, with A.G. Wasden, and that was one of the mild ones. I had another occasion when uh, they put my, my picture up in a bowling alley in Owyhee County and threw darts at it because they didn't like the fact that I was upholding the rule of law. Um, so. The question is really for us, um, uh, how, do we, how do we maintain that? It's, it's really important that we do it. It's really what is gonna help us as lawyers and, and keep, keep, your, keep your mind on that. Lawrence, I wanna, can I just jump in for a yeah, second? Yeah, please. I, you know, you know, I think all of us are confronting these kinds of questions about um, how far we're willing to go, what do we stand for on a more regular basis? And so, you know, this is personal and and you don't have to answer it, but you know, what sustains you? What sustained me? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, a couple of things. One of them is my faith. I'll be honest with you that it is, and I I made 
promises to do what was right, and I'm trying to do that. Uh, I have an incredibly amazing Hi. wife. She is incredible. Uh, and so, and she was my campaign manager, by the way. And so I, she was very sustaining. Uh, it's helped me a great deal. Although I will tell you on one occasion when I filed uh, the, uh, the case on the cottage side, she said to me, what are you doing? And I said, oh, don't you want me to uphold the rule of law? She said, no, I'm trying to get you uh, elected. You can hold up the rule of law next year. But she has been very, very supportive. I have really supportive children. My children have a variety of political views. Uh, and, um, and there are being able to sit down and talk with them, get their views, and their, their views are different from mine. To me, that is a very healthy environment because they would all come together and pull together on my behalf. I had a wonderful staff in the office of the attorney general. They knew and understood what it was I was trying to do and accomplish, and my executive team was stellar. And so those are the things that sustained me. And we had to take on some pretty hard battles. Yeah, that's, I just, that's what I had. I think it's just really important to think about that as well, because, you know, you do have to have all of those things in your life in order to be able to continue to do the really hard things um, that, that you've done. And so, you know, for, again, for the law students on here and the young lawyers, I think making sure that you have your communities, whatever that form takes, and that you did that you take care of your family, and that that's a strong relationship. And uh, and I'm saying this in part so that I hear it because I don't. Yeah, there's a lot of nights good. I don't get home on time. So Amy, sorry, thank you for uh, letting me have another one. Oh, and Cal, and you're an example of the very things you're talking about, and I'm I'm proud of you for that. Thank you. Yeah, great. Well, continuing a little bit on that. Um, uh, we had two young early professionals and uh, attorneys that had a similar question that they would like to have advice um, on, on how they can advance their careers early on as a, as a lawyer. And are there associations or assignment ideas that you might have for them as they're getting off the ground? Yeah, the number one thing I would say to you is learn how to shake people's hands and look them in the eye. And they probably already have that, but they can be more outgoing by doing that. I, I, I tell the story of uh, going to uh, the Aspen Institute uh, and um, the, I was the president of, or the chairman of the board of directors of the American Legacy Foundation, which is now the Truth Initiative. And we had to go and create some friendships. I happened to be at a meeting and there was uh, Katie Couric and uh, Barbara Streisand and I can't remember her husband's name, whatever his name is big famous actor and they were the core of this meeting so you know all the bees are buzzing around there and someone came up to me that was supposed to be making contacts and said boy this is really hard because of all of the stuff going on over there and I said just stand here and look around you and standing around the periphery was a whole bunch of people that were feeling out of place mm -hmm. go over and shake their hand talk to them look them in the eye introduce yourself though that's one of the things that helps creating those friendships, and not even friendships, but acquaintanceships that allow you to really be success, successful as a lawyer. Um, and those things work internationally as well by, being, by be, being willing to do that. And the next thing I would say to young lawyers is um, spend your time, do your preparation. Make sure when you walk into the courtroom or you walk into that client on a contract that you know what you're talking about. Build the confidence not only in you, but in them that uh, that you that you know what you're doing one person said to me once uh, i was prosecuting a case and they said well when you grow up are you going to be a lawyer <laughs> yeah right well what do you think i am chopped liver of course that's what i'm going to do but i'm saying uh but be confident but not overly confident not arrogant arrogance doesn't doesn't suffice for confidence uh you go in there uh, aware of what you are know your case know your your client, know, know your contract, whatever it is, but go in there having that sound foundation. And then you over time make a huge impression. So those are my, those are two things that I'd say that young lawyers need to do. And Dean Cobb, do you have any <clears throat> suggestions? Oh, goodness. Uh, I feel like people hear my suggestions all the time, but you know, one of the things that I do, one way to do that, particularly if you're 
um, not somebody who started shaking everybody's hand in I don't know. Was that when you were five, or did you? That was a couple of years later. Oh no, I was in I was high school when I did okay that. high school by the handshaking. If you're not that, you know, we have a really really wonderful bar, um, and there's sections for absolutely everything, and you know they are looking always for people to get involved in different ways, and so there's a way to find your way into it, and and um, and so if you're somebody for whom it's hard to just naturally make those connections. I, I would strongly suggest getting involved with one of the bar sections and, and getting to know folks that way around one area of interest. And, and you would be astounded at how quickly that network builds out because, because everybody here is connected. And, and um, so I would, I would recommend that. And, uh, you know, and we also do a lot of different, we have a lot of really interesting opportunities at the law school where we bring people back for professionalism day, we bring people back um, to teach, we bring people back to uh, to do, I'm looking again at Tara to teach in our trial advocacy program. And so, you know, stay connected with us. And that's true, whether you're one of our, if you are an Idaho lawyer, I consider you one of my alums, whether you went to our law school or not. Um, so come get connected, you know, with other, with other, um, with other young lawyers, with students, um, and use us as a as a launching pad. Um, we're, we are here for you as well. Dean, Dean Cobb, on, on that on your on the professionalism day, I my my hats off to uh, Dean Burnett because he started that. Mm -hmm. That is an incredible incredible tool to help introduce students uh, to the to the profession. But one thing that it does for the participants, the lawyers and judges that, that participate in that, it reminds us of what we're about, why we went to law school. And so it, there's, a, there's a great uh, benefit to those of us who participate. And so it, uh, of us who are lawyers out there, if you're given the opportunity to participate in that, take it every time you can, because it really is a meaningful experience. And I've had dozens of, of now lawyers in this state who come to me and said, hey, I was in your professionalism day class and I remember it. And those are important things. I think it's really, really incredible. Yes, no, I, I completely agree with you. And and I, I will say one of the things that gives me light when um, I'm feeling down about the state of the world, the state of the law, you know, is the is always our students. Um, and so I, you know, I was I, that invitation was was sort of a written response for for people starting out. Um, but I think even, you know, for those of you uh, much, even much further along, you know, it, it really is a great way to to connect with what the point of all this is, and um, and, and and to be in front of people who are who are really starry eyed often about what we can do in this profession. And even as I say it, I get the chills again, which is why it's <laughs> it's such a great thing to work in a law school. So come hang out with us; we will inspire you. Sorry, well, Amy. That's great. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Um, I'm going to end this last question. Uh, there were questions we just couldn't get to, and I apologize. Um, but I think this is a good one to end it on. And you guys were touching on it a little bit. But what does the future of uh, the law profession look like? Um, a lot of people have said that they are a recovering attorney. There are said there are also... Um, have started as an attorney, have a different path now, but others love this profession. So what does the future of being an attorney look like? That's a really good question. I think that the profession is changing, has to change, will change, whether we like it or not. We have to stay with that change, but we also have to kind of uh, remain the, the steadfast. That is, we, we can't separate our future from our past. We have to rely on where we've been to guide where we're going in the future. Things like the internet clearly change the context in which we operate. Uh, social media has changed the way people communicate. And it has also changed the way people think about the law and not in necessarily in a positive way. Uh, I, I will tell you television and the internet, you know, somebody thinks that they can just do a quick little Google search and that answers every life's question. And the answer is it doesn't. And so part of it is we have to be uh, education. We have to be aware of what we're going and teach the public. That's one of the things that I think is a profession 
we need to do better. Uh, I think totally as our educational system, one of the things that our education system has failed to do, it has failed to teach people to think critically. And that's why we end up with these great extremes is because people don't have that skill. And it's difficult for some people and it's even diff difficult for some lawyers. I won't say anything about some other elements of the state government on that. I'll just be quiet. Uh, so uh, I think that it will change. I think that we need to be actively involved through the bar, among other things, to see that the laws are appropriate um, and that they are timely, that they address the current legal st set of legal issues that we have to face. Uh, and I, I think that as, as the bar, we've been pretty good, but I think we could be a lot better in terms of educating folks out there and helping form the public's opinion about what the law is and what it should be. I can't tell you how many presentations I have engaged in trying to teach the difference between policy and law. A lot of people just don't get that one. And uh, that would be very helpful in terms of what we can accomplish into the future in the legal profession if people simply understood that distinction. Wonderful. Well, this has been, this hour just flew by. Um, you had a lot of compliments posted in the chat. Some of them you probably see, some of them you don't. People just really, really have appreciated uh, your public service, getting to know you, your commitment to the university, lots of wonderful remarks. So we, we really, really have uh, enjoyed having you. And we will have to have a part two because there's just other questions here. Um, with that, you'll be that. excellent. We'll be receiving. You'll be receiving a cup of Joe mug from us. As a <laughs> and I also wanted to let po folks know that this is recorded and it'll be out there, and we'll post all of that. Um, and then also on March 9th, we will have um, a discussion with Navrin Shetri, and he is the leading the um, Lionel Hampton School of Music and the Jazz Fest. So you can't. It's going to be in April this year. It's going to be so much fun. And there's so much great history here. So don't miss the, that next cup of joe. But uh, thank you, jo Johanna, Dean Kalb, for, for all of your um, support here. And of course, Lawrence, for being here. And Sandy, for helping us. So thank you, everybody. And you. go Vandals. Go, go Vandals. Vandals. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, Lawrence. Thank you, Dean. I really appreciate it. I'm yeah. I'm happy to do this again. If if you find Absolutely. that useful, if you don't, no, I feel like we only barely scratched the surface, and um, so much more, so much more to think about. And um, so, thank you. Uh, we'll get together, and we'll do some offline too. Sounds good <laughs> as well. All right. Thank you very much. Right. Goodbye, Goodbye everybody. Top, Tara, I was bragging about you. <laughs>